but the Lord will never, never leave me. We have several prayer requests here. And a prayer for neighbors and son-in-law who suffered a stroke at the age of 60, and that's from the Griffins. Uh, the Niles family, pray for Dave. He is being tested on Monday. Pray for a positive outcome. And uh, we pray also here for Monica Anderson. She fell in the house and injured her replacement knee, so we need to pray for her. Uh, I got a prayer request, salvation of children and grandchildren. Praise the Lord of heaven and earth. And uh, there's no name on that. Uh, Lloyd, uh, Simon family, they're grieving the loss of both mother, daughter, in uh, the drowning this week. And some of you might recall it, that where the car went into the water. Uh, Monica Anderson fell on her knee. Oh, I read that one already. And uh, she hit her head. She's awaiting update from the x-rays. So we have these requests. Let's take them to the Lord, okay? Father in heaven, we've just read these. You heard them even as I read them. You knew them before I even read them. But we were praying for them because you told us to pray. You commanded us to pray. To pray always. To pray without ceasing. Lord, we lift these up and we ask, O oh God, that uh, they would sense your presence because you said you will never leave us nor forsake us even to the end of the age. May they sense your presence and your power. Work in such a way that each one of these requests is answered so that the praise and the glory and the honor is given to you alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, my topic today here is holding off the evil forces that we face with a pea shooter. A pea shooter. I and mean, sometimes you say, wait a minute. I'm going up against some very formidable foes, and you're telling me I can do it with a pea shooter? Yes, but as we go into this, I want to say that there's really a huge spiritual war going on. Every day there's a spiritual battle going on. And the first thing I want to note here is, and we went over some of this last time, there is a war, an all-out war against marriage. We went over the divorce rates last time. I'm not going to reiterate all those uh, facts and figures again. But our adversary is trying to divorce, to, to destroy the family, and the key way to do that is simply to work divorce in the families of America. There is an assault on the unborn, the preborn. Uh, these lives, in fact, the one political party has people championing even post-birth abortions. I can't believe this. Is this America? There is an all-out assault. Why? Well, it goes like this. There's a real spiritual war going on that is an assault on God. God made man in his image. We're made in the image of God. And so if you want to make an assault on God, what do you do? You destroy other men because they are image bearers of God. Image bearers. There's a spiritual war going on behind the scenes. I read all the statistics last time about abuse, child abuse, sex abuse, all the rest. This is an assault on childhood kids. So their, their lives are so, so messed up, so bad, so badly, from sometimes even their own parents, their own father, to distort what it says that God is our father. Come on, if God is your father and the only person you can liken him to is somebody who's abused you, well, if God is a father, I don't want him, right? There's an all-out assault, spiritual battle going on. Here's the latest one. God created man in his image. And it's, the Bible says he created them male and female. That's it. Biologically, your DNA will tell you exactly what you are, no confusion. Every scientist will be able to tell you whether you're a man or a woman. And now all of a sudden we come along and we say, well, listen, we don't like God's categories, we're going to make our own. I just heard recently there's 112 different categories. Are you kidding me? I mean, why didn't get rid of the pronouns, him, her, he, she. I guess we just call everybody it. Reminds me of the days when there was cousin it. Remember cousin it? <laughs> cousin it? Yeah, some of you remember. And thing, you know, Adam's family. What was the other one? No. Yeah. Anyway, our, our, our culture is just totally messed up, but it's a spiritual war on that which is true and that which is right. That's what's going on. We are always on a slippery slope. We give an inch, they take a mile. We give an inch, they take a mile. We talked about all the statistics last week about how alcohol is really destroying our young people. And now we've legalized not just medical marijuana, because every, every drug 
probably has a good use somewhere. So we're not, we're not against good uses of, of any drug, but it's the abuse. Now we've made it recreational, just recreational. Before we were concerned about drunk drivers behind the wheel. Now we've got to be concerned about addicted people behind the wheel, behind the wheel. Listen, there's a spiritual war going on to try to destroy us, to try to destroy us. People are hurting everywhere. They are. People are hurting. They're, war they're actually wounded in a spiritual war, but they don't know it. They deny it. They don't even believe that it exists. People are bleeding from the wounds, from infidelity and relationships, separation, divorce, abuse, addictions, gender confusion, and the list could go on and on. I could spend a the whole time just talking about the evils of our culture, couldn't I? You know that. I mean, I haven't even talked about politics yet, have I? Oh yeah, a little bit. The evils in politics. I one time heard a gentleman lecturing when I was a Bible college student. A governor came in and he was giving a lecture to us and said, man, we need more Christians in politics. And then he started with his, you know, he started with his message towards the end. He said, you know what, I don't think you can be a Christian and be in politics. <laughs> now, isn't that a contradiction of terms? It's, it's corrupt. I mean, the evils. People are hurting everywhere. That's what I want to say. Many are wounded by yielding to temptation. Temptation that comes in a form of sexual impulses, and they have infidelity, separation, divorce. A temptation because you're irritable and upset to be abusive to somebody else, to vent on them, to unload on them. A temptation comes along because of your weakness to a certain substance or drink or whatever, and, and you just cave and give in completely. Okay, because of all your confusion, you give in to some temptation. I'm here to tell you, Jesus gives the victory. Jesus gives the victory. And with all the spiritual warfare going on, you're not going to win the battle without Jesus. <clears throat> Still, there's a few things we need to know, and that's where we're at. We're in the last message in the book of Ephesians. And he says, finally. Finally. We know he's wrapping up because he says, finally. Now, not in all of the books does he say, finally, and then wrap it up. And there's a couple where he says, finally, and then that's only halfway through the book. But here he says, finally. He's wrapping it up. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord. First thing I want to know is if we're going to be strong, we have to know who our enemy is. If you don't identify the enemy, your enemy is going to take you down every time because you don't know who he is. And so in our passage, it says the enemy of us in our spiritual warfare, the enemy's leader is the devil. And I know there's a lot of people don't believe in the devil. They say, oh, this is just some kind of fictitious thing. No, the, the devil is a real person. Jesus believed in the devil. Jesus was tempted by the devil. You go through the Bible, the devil is mentioned a lot. Now, the word devil just simply means slanderer. He slanders. He slanders. He's the leader. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand, stand against the devil's schemes. We're going to come back to this verse, but I just want to move on to the 12th verse. The enemy actually attacks, because that's what it says, for our struggles. Who's he attacking? He's attacking us. There's a spiritual war going on, and the devil is out to take you down, to take you down. Our struggle, he says, in fact, is an invisible struggle, but it is real because it is not against flesh and blood. It's not like I'm going up against some other wrestler in a match or I'm in a boxing with another person. Uh, this is a spiritual battle. It's not against flesh and blood. But, he says, it's organized. There's an organized assault to take you down. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, that's the title of a rank of angels. Against authorities, another title of a rank of angels. And powers, another title of a rank of angels. And these are all fallen angels because they have as their leader the devil. He says, and against the spiritual forces, oh, there's even more of these Invisible, angelic fallen beings, sometimes we call them demons. They're demons. Forces of evil that are in heavenly places. You remember the book of Job. Satan went into the presence of God one day. And God says, to him, hey, have you considered my servant Job? He says, oh, Job only, 
Job only follows you and serves you because you blessed him so much. You take away his blessings, he'll curse you. And then God works out, negotiates this deal. Go ahead, test him, just don't take his life. You know the story. Spiritual battle is going on behind the scenes. Poor Job doesn't know any of the story. You realize that? He doesn't know that this is going on. Kind of like you. You don't know when you've got problems. Is there a spiritual battle going on here because there's some evil being trying to take me down? Or is this just a natural occurrence of life? You don't know. You know one will know on the other side. Kind of like Job on the other side. Once the book was written, oh, and then he could read the books. Ah, now I see what was going on behind the scenes. Because his eyes were open. His eyes were open. Our struggle, there is a spiritual war going on to take you down. It's organized. And I want to tell you, the devil's been at this for a really long time. He knows, he's an expert at what he does. And he is out to take you down. It's powerful. I notice these key words. Powers of this dark world. <laughs> Remember in uh, Star Wars, the dark force, the dark force. You know, they have all these modern terms for basic good and evil that when you put the right terms in there, you got, you know, the light, Christ, and you got darkness, the devil. It makes a whole different story. But anyway, the powers of darkness and the forces of evil that seem to run rampant in our world today, they reach even to the heavenly realm, heavenly realm. There is a powerful adversary out there trying to take us down. And this struggle that we have has behind it scheming. Put on the full armor of God, verse 11. I backed up from 12 to 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's a schemer. King James puts it this way. Sometimes I just like the way King James puts it. Calls it the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. You say, well, I don't even know what that means, wiles of the devil. Remember this character? Anybody remember this character? There's a cartoon series called The Roadrunner, and his nemesis was Wiley Coyote. Wiley, Wiley. Wiley Coyote was after that Roadrunner, and, and he, would, he had more schemes, more tricks, you remember, and he'd always get some gadget, something that, that he would try to trap the roadrunner, but it was always foiled and boomerang back on him. And that's kind of like the gospel story. Satan is a schemer. He is out to take you down. He's got so many tricks up his sleeve, but Jesus is the spoiler. He's a spoiler. If you're with Jesus, he can't take you down. He can't take you down. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes to Corinthians, said, we are not ignorant of his schemes. We're not ignorant of his schemes. Satan is a schemer, and we're not ignorant. Well, what are his schemes? You say, well, maybe I don't, I'm not sure that I know. You see, he's got a scheming attack or assault on all of us, and here's the things he does. He lies. He lies. He's a liar. He will tell you, hey, one more drink won't get you drunk. Oh, yes, it will. Hey, you don't, 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 don't worry about, don't worry about your, your sex, whether you're a male or female. God loves everybody. Be whatever you want to be. He lies. He lies. Hey, you, you can go through it all. Hey, an abortion is okay because you can't really afford the kid. He lies. He lies. He cast doubt in the Garden of Eden. Very first thing he did, he went to Eve, and his very first strategy, his very first scheme, he goes to Eve and he says, did God really say? He questions God's word. Anytime you're reading the Bible and you begin to question what's there, you know that behind the scenes there is a schemer trying to get you to doubt the word of God. He wants you to think for a moment that that is not true, that is not authoritative, that's not from God. That could be wrong because I know better than God. And it's convicting me, and I don't like what it's saying to me, so I'll just change and pick a different part to read because I don't want that to, to mess with me. He's behind that. He's the tempter. Notice the next one. He tempts. He, Jesus was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days. 
The Luke account tells us that he was being tempted the whole time. The whole time. The Matthew account records for us all three temptations that were at the very end. So after 40 days of being tempted, he gives them three temptations. And you know what? He's a master. Every time, Jesus did not yield to temptation, but instead he quoted the word of God. When oh, we come back to the word. See, he wants you to doubt it so you won't use it. If I doubt it, I won't use it. If I doubt it, I won't use it. He's a murderer. In fact, Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. When he, when he tempted Adam and Eve to fall in the garden, he brought the whole human race under the umbrella of death. He's the ultimate murderer. He's a killer. He entices and, and, and he beguiles. He makes things look attractive. That's why in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul calls him the angel of light. He, you know, he doesn't run around with a pitchfork and a red long tail and horns on his head. No, no, he doesn't look at something ugly. He tries to make the temptation as beautiful as it possibly could be. It doesn't say this in the Bible, but I think Bathsheba was probably a knockout of a woman. She probably was very attractive, so that when David looked over on the other rooftop and saw her bathing, she was beautiful and attractive. That temptation didn't come because she was ugly. He was using something very beautiful. That's the way he operates. He entices, he beguiles, he slanders, he runs your name through the mud, and he accuses us. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 tells us that he is the accuser of the brethren. That's how it works. Your pastor, Dennis Henderson, goes and sins. He does. I'm a sinner just like the rest of you. Satan runs right in the rear presence of God and says, <laughs> Did you see him? He's the pastor. Did you see what he did? How can he be a Christian? Look, he's a low life. Look what he's doing. Right? He's the accuser. Job. Oh, Job only, Job only follows you because, because you bless him. He's the accuser, and, and every time he does that, my advocate, 1 John 2, 2, my advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, he stands up. An advocate means he's my attorney. He stands up and pleads my case. And all he does to plead my case is he shows his wounded hands and says, I paid the price for that. He's forgiven. Let him go. Let him go. But he's the accuser. He's accuser. He accuses us. What's the point? The point is we need to know our enemy. My second point, though, is we need to know ourselves. Ourselves. We need to know something about ourselves. The first thing is it's our responsibility. The passage says, put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. God provides all the armor we need so that we can engage the adversary. But we must put it on. If you have all the armor sitting over here, you know, in the morning you get up, you got all your armor over there, but you say, oh, I don't think I need that today. I can do this on my own. You are prone for disaster to fall. You must put on the armor. That's our responsibility, to put it on, so that you can take your stand against the devil and all of his scheming. Now, the next thing I notice is our, our responsibility here to stand. He says this like four times, that you can take your stand. You go down verse 13, that you may be able to stand. You go again in 13, he says, having done everything to stand. In the next verse, he says, to stand, stand. There's an old gospel song. It says, uh, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation hall. It's a fighting, not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. I came here to stay. I'm, I'm taking my stand. I'm not retreating. When he comes and he attacks with the temptation and all else, he said, I am going to stand. It's your responsibility to stand. To stand. Just to stand. It's also our responsibility to armor up. We've got to put it on. Why? Why do we have to armor up? Here's the reason why. Because we're vulnerable. You and I are vulnerable. We have some vulnerability. The very first one he, he goes to is he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. It's got to be truth that we take our stand on. And, and, and he's describing a, a Roman's armor here. And he's got the, the truth girt around his loins. And, and this, it's used as something like a, a belt that you tighten up so that you can grunt against, put pressure against, and, and leverage against in a battle. 
He's expecting us to have the truth as that by which we leverage our lives. And Jesus said, I am the truth. He said, thy word is truth. The Bible is the truth. So I've got to have a relationship with Jesus, and I've got to be in his word. And when I'm having a relationship with Jesus, I'm in his word, and then I can battle. I can battle. But without a relationship with him, the truth, and a relationship with the Bible, the word, I have no belt on. My belt's gone. I have nothing with, to hold myself and, and, and to pressure, and press against so that I might do battle. Our bellies are very vulnerable. Next, our, ha- our heart is vulnerable. He says, once you get the belt, uh, buckle down really tight. He says, with the breastplate of righteousness. I put this chest protector on. And uh, it's righteousness. It's the breastplate of righteousness. It's Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And because I know him, he works in my life so that I live to please him a righteous life. I do what is right. And as I do that, I got the breastplate of righteousness protecting my heart. Protecting my heart. He goes on and says, our feet are vulnerable. He says, that, and your feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. My feet are ready then to engage in battle, but I engage in battle. I take my stand with the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came into the world to pay the price of our sin on the cross, that when we believe in him, we might be freed from all of our sins and that we might have a new life in him. We take that gospel and we travel with it. We spread that message. My feet are fitted with that readiness. He goes on and he says, listen, our bodies are vulnerable. He says, in addition, take this up, take the shield of faith. The shield of faith is that I have placed my trust in the Lord. My confidence is in him, not in myself. I have the shield of faith. It is the things that I believe. I believe the Bible will be the word of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe. And, and I, we just go down to, through the creed. I believe. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the resurrection. I believe. I believe. These are truths that we believe because when I take up the shield and I'm engaging in battle, he is hurling all these flaming darts. He's, the, the adversary is shooting at me, trying to take me down, and they are just glancing off my faith. When someone is questioning my faith, and they're glancing off, because I believe. Remember the man that was born blind? The disciples, why, did he, why was he born blind? John chapter 9. Did he sin or did his parents sin? Jesus said, it was, that's not really the issue here. This is so you might see the glory of God and the work of God. He spit on the ground, he mixed that spit with the dirt, made mud, and he anointed the blind man's eyes. He anointed his eyes. Now, that was really silly. When was the last time you went to the eye doctor and you put a little bit of dirt in your eye? <laughs> he says, now go wash. He went and washed, he came back seeing, and he gets stopped. There's three, three times he gives his testimony in John chapter 9. But the one that intrigues me is they called him uh, because the theologians of the day, the people that knew their Bibles of the day, he said, we know that this man is a sinner, so how can it, because he does, because he healed people on the Sabbath day. We know that this man is a sinner. Who do you think he is? He said, well, whether he's a sinner or not, uh, that I don't know, but I'll tell you this. I once was blind, but now I see. Listen, I believe he gave my sight. See, he knew what he believed. He knew what he believed. When we know what we believe, and, and the enemy is shooting a dart, trying to get us tripped up, get us messed up, it glances off because I go back to what I believe. So I have to know what I believe. I put that shield of faith up. I know what I believe. I know what I believe. The next is our heads are very vulnerable. He says, taking the helmet of salvation, that Jesus Christ is my Savior, protects my head, my mind. So when he's trying to mess with my mind and trying to deceive me and trick me and he's scheming, in my head, I sort through it all and say, no, this is not of God. Jesus is my Savior. I'm not going down that path. And then he comes to your hands. Your hands are vulnerable. He says, so no, put in your hand the sword of the Spirit. And then he defines it for us. He says, which is the Word of God? Do you realize that in all the equipment that he's given us, that he tells us to put on, the sword is the only offensive weapon. Everything else is to defend us. God gave us our Bibles, our Bibles, as our offensive weapon. When Satan came to Jesus and tempted him for those 40 days, every time Jesus said, it is written, 
The Greek text says this. It's in the perfect tense, which can be translated this way. It stands written. It's as strong as you can make it. It, it was written, and it's still got an abiding value to today. It is written, and it stands. And he quoted the scripture over, over, and over again. Because that is our offensive weapon. When he comes, we quote the scripture. When a temptation comes, we quote the scripture. And pretty soon, that temptation is gone. It is gone. It is gone. Because of the word of God. You see, we must know ourselves. Poet put it this way as we come to the next section here. We must know our God. You see, the word of God is our sword, our only offensive weapon. It's the word of God. It's the word of God that tells us of him. But the next section of this passage is, it is through the P shooter. And P stands for prayer. It's through prayer that we come to know him. The poet put it this way, I had a battle fierce today within my place of prayer. I went to meet and talk with God, but I found Satan there. He said, you can't really pray. You lost out long ago. You may say words while on your knees, but you can't pray, you know. So then I pulled my helmet down, way down upon my ears, found it helped to still his voice and helped to lay my fears. I checked my other armor or my loins with truth were, were gird. My, my feet with peace were shod, my sword, the word of God. My righteous breastplate still was on, my heart's love to protect. My shield of faith was all intact. His fiery darts bounced back. So then I prayed in Jesus' name, and I pled the precious blood. While Satan sneaked away in shame, I met and talked with God. If there's anything he wants you to do, it is to not pray. To not pray. To slap yourself on the back, say, I can handle this. I got it, Lord. This is mine. If there's anything he wants you to do is neglect that armor and not put it on. Don't do that. Don't do that. So how should we pray? And that's what he's going to go on in this passage. Tell us. This is how you use the armor. You put on the armor, and then he says, and pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Some time ago, one of our members here in the church found out what it is to pray in the Spirit. The gentleman's here with us today. He was in a conference in, I believe it was in England, and uh, he was meeting with uh, uh, some potential shareholders in a business venture he was doing. About 200 present, and all of a sudden, when they were doing their, their, their presentation, a man in the back made a big commotion, and everybody went around him because he had stopped breathing. They said it was a heart attack, a heart attack. And now the gentleman that's with us today, he was speaking at the time. He stopped. And he ran to the back and he said, he knew the Spirit of God was prompting his heart to do this. He said, because normally my arthritis would not let me like jump and run like that. And it was fine. And then he got there and he just prompted him, put your hand on his heart. The man was lying on his right side. He reached down and he put his hand on his heart. And then he did something. He said that the Spirit of God prompted him to say out loud with everybody around, because there's a group watching him, there's nothing I have that I can give you, but in the name of Jesus, you're healed. That's what he said. And the man took a big breath, got right back up. The, you know, the paramedics and those were all around, and they, they ministered to him for a little while, and then he sat up and he stayed for the rest of the meeting. Now, what prompts you to do that? That's praying in the Spirit. See, you're, when you're walking with the Lord and the Spirit, the Spirit prompts you that you will pray. I've been in a similar situation, been into a room uh, where I, I, the person is supposed to not be conscious at all and then talk and then boom, they come right out. And one doctor one time told me, did you set this up? Uh, no, I didn't set this up. I mean, uh, we just prayed. This person that wasn't supposed to be able to talk because of their stroke just spoke right out. Boom. How is that? He says, you pray in the Spirit. So that means you've got to have a relationship with God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. You've got to have the Spirit working in your life and pray in the Spirit. Now watch what he says. On all occasions. All occasions. I know some places it's pretty hard to pray. I know some of you have a hard time just praying for your lunch. Out in public place. At the table. 
I go into the Wendy's and there's these two gigantic burly guys and head of me and they buy and I'm thinking in my head, man, they are gigantic. I sure hate to run into these two guys in an alley. <laughs> they go over and they sit at the table and then something melted in my heart. It just melted my heart. They bowed their heads and they prayed. They asked God's blessing for the food. You know what a, what a witness that was? We went out for lunch uh, uh, last week after church, and there we were after we were leaving. I said to the ladies that were going up to the register behind us, I said, what church you go to? Because I, I knew they had been to church. And, and uh, everybody said to me, well, how did you know that? They were church-going people. I said, because I saw them praying for their meal. <laughs> right? He said, he says, pray on all occasions, not just when you're in a jam, not just at mealtime, not just at bedtime, you can have a conversation all day. I called a good friend of mine one time, John Burke, and I said, hey, John, uh, I said, I called, but your receptionist said uh, you were, you know, you're having a meeting. He said, oh, yeah, it was lunchtime. He said, I skipped my lunch, and my meeting is, uh, I tell, uh, tell her to say that because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a meeting with God. <laughs> that was my lunch prayer time. You see, you can just pray any time, any place, he says, on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. You know, you can pray other than asking God for something. Did you know that? You can pray without, you don't have to ask for anything. You can just say, thank you, Lord, for everything you gave me. Or, or, you know, you can skip even the thanks. You can say, God, you are totally awesome to think that you created everything. You can just tell God how great he is. That's a prayer of praise. You can do that. You can do that. There are all kinds of prayers and all kinds of requests. You don't have to just request things for yourself. You can be a mediator and request things for other people. There's all kinds of them. You can pray. Hey, he says, with this in mind, be alert. You say, why would he put that in there? Well, have you ever tried to pray and found yourself mind wandering and falling asleep? Yeah, if, you're better, if you've prayed at certain times, you know that Jesus told the disciples, hey, stay here and pray while I go yonder and pray. What do you do? He came back, they're sound asleep. He wakes them up, goes back. You know the story. Because it's, you've got to stay alert, focused on your prayers. And then he says, always keep on praying persistently, persistently persistently. I like the way it says in Thessalonians chapter 5, pray without ceasing. And the Greek term for without ceasing uh, is actually in the Greek medical books of the ancient world for a nagging cough. You know how that works? That doesn't mean you have one continuous cough. It means you cough, <clears throat> and you get it over with, and then you go a little bit, and it starts scratching, and you've got to cough again. You've got to do it again. And then it irritates you a little more. You cough again. And so what it means is praying without ceasing, and praying always, it means you just keep coming back to it, coming back to it, coming back to it, and do it all day long, all day long. You can do it while you're driving. Just don't close your eyes, okay? When he said watch and pray, that's what he meant. Keep your eyes open, pray, pray. But you can pray, keep on praying, keep on praying, keep on praying. Notice what he says, pray for all the saints. Pray also for me. Pray for people. People. Sometimes we pray for stuff. Be nice, Lord, if I had a new car. Be nice, Lord, and, you know, a job. He's focused on praying for people. 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 He prays for courage in the people. He says, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. He's saying that I will have the courage and the boldness to share my faith. Paul says, you know, sometimes I'm a little timid. That's what he's saying. I can't think of Paul as being timid. But he's saying, I, I need to have courage to do this. Pray for me that I will share the gospel. He says, for which and I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, fearlessly, without fear. Just be bold in, in my witness. And he says, pray for yourself pray that I might ah. be an ambassador representing Jesus Christ. So that when people see me, they know that they've seen Jesus in me. Isn't that great? Here's the point. We win and lose most of our spiritual fights on the battlefield of prayer because we think we can do it without God. We should be praying as we put on the complete armor. 
Paul concludes his little uh, letter to Ephesians. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am, <clears throat> how I am and what I'm doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and he may encourage you. Tychicus is one of his side partners in the gospel ministry, and he is now his mailman. He sends him as the messenger with, with the message in hand. You know, every part of the body of Christ is necessary. We can't all be preachers. Some of us are going to take the message back to the workplace, back to their neighborhood, back to the grocery store, back to the guy that takes care of your car. You're going to take it because I, I don't have those contacts. You are a living epistle. Your life is read of everybody. You just got to put with that life action the boldness to share Jesus. The final verses here are peace to the brothers and love uh, with faith from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all of you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Wow. Here's my final thoughts on all of this. We are all in a spiritual conflict. All of us. We must take up the armor and stand. Nobody's going to do that for us. We have to do that ourselves. Put on all those pieces of armor. We only have the one offensive weapon, and that is the Bible. Okay? You need that Bible. You need the Word of God. You need to be reading it, memorizing it, quoting it, using it. It is your only offensive weapon. We must use the Bible, though, along with the pea shooter. <laughs> Just a little prayer. You've got to pray. You've got to pray. When we do, this is what happens. We hold off the forces of evil with a pea shooter. <laughs> We do. We hold them off. We take our stand. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this little book of uh, Ephesians. It's a powerful book. Lord, if we were to go through it again, we'd find other truths that would just pop out at us and we'd learn and glean more. Uh, Lord, we know that this is just a, such a wonderful book. And today, we've been focusing on our armor and using it through prayer. When we're in the Word, you speak to us. When we pray, we speak to you, and we have a relationship. Lord, I pray that we will go from this place, building that relationship with you, strengthened to take our stand that we might share our faith with those we come in contact with, that they may even ask the reason of hope that lies within us so that we might talk to them about Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Bless us today, Lord, that we will take the stand. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.